And uh, out of this fourth kingdom, we're told that ten kings shall arise. And up to this point, they have not received a kingdom. Now, this is in light of Daniel's prophecy, uh, right back here, and looking forward, that when this fourth beast does arise, there's going to be ten kings which shall arise uh, out of this fourth kingdom. So, let's try to illustrate it by these little marks here. Two, three, four, five... Six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Have I got it right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. All right. Now, out of this fourth kingdom, ten shall arise. Now, this is illustrated on the chart by this fourth kingdom with the ten mountain peaks. Now, let's go on. <coughs> it says this. And the ten kings out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall arise, and another shall rise after them. So I'm told that the one that's to come after comes after the ten already are in existence. Isn't that right? There's one to be subsequent. Now then it says this, And another shall arise, and he shall be diverse from the first, and he shall subdue three kings. Now I'm just simply going to put the illustration like this, because uh, this one is to be, of course, greater. He's going to have, uh, in light of verse 25, he shall speak uh, great words against the Most High and wear out the saints of the Most High, think to change times and laws, and they shall be given to his hand until a time and times and a dividing of time. Now, he's going to be a, a great one that comes up and says that he's going to subdue three of these kings. But notice now, it does not say when. Isn't that right? It simply tells us that this one is going to subdue three, but it does not tell us when. Now let's come back to uh, Revelation chapter 17, because we feel as though this needs just a little clarification. In the 17th chapter of the book of Revelation, we have another image given to us. Now, I've, I've drawn it this way, hoping that <clears throat> this will act as an illustration also. Now, the image that you have here is a great beast, and he has seven heads and ten horns. Isn't that right? Uh, there's the beast that has the seven heads and the ten horns. Now, we looked at the seven, but just to... Uh, catch our thread of thought up again. Let me go back and review, beginning with verse 9. And here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads of that seven uh, of that beast are seven mountains on which the woman or the harlot sits. Now then, and they are seven kings. They are seven kings. You remember this is the prophecy from uh, John the Beloved standing here somewhere around 90 A.D., after Pentecost had become a reality, the church, uh, the body of Christ began on the day of Pentecost. And so he's telling us of a prophecy of a beast that has seven heads and ten horns. And there's a great harlot that rides this beast. Now we're trying to find out the meaning of all of these things, which are uh, aspects of image and so forth. All right? And he says the, the seven heads are seven kings. Isn't that right? Uh, at least uh, the seven, they are seven kings. Now then, from this point of view, five have fallen. As we look back on the chart, we can see one, two, three, four, five. Five great Gentile kingdoms that as far as biblical prophecy is concerned or biblical history is concerned, and also secular history too, that you find these five, which are more or less the dominant kingdoms of the civilized world at that time. You have the great kingdom of Egypt. And you remember Abraham, when he had his difficulties, he went down into Egypt. Why? Because she was mistress of the world, and of course she had food down there in her storehouse, and he went down there uh, simply uh, because it was a famine. 
Then the next great kingdom that supplanted the Egyptian kingdom is that which is called the Assyrian kingdom with the capital at Nineveh. And then following the Assyrian kingdom, as we mentioned, is the Babylonian kingdom that had its beginning in 612 BC. And then around the 530s, you have the Medo-Persia kingdom supplanting the Babylonian kingdom. And then in 330 BC, the great Grecian general Alexander the Great becoming the master of the entire world. And so here are the five. There's Greece, Medo-Persia, Babylon, Assyria, and Egypt. We're told that from John the Beloved's point of view of prophesying, five of these kings have fallen. Five of them. And he says, what? One exists. One is. There in verse 10, five kings have fallen and one exists. Well, of course, Rome in 146 B.C., she became the mistress of the world. Now, the Roman Empire, listen carefully to me, the Roman Empire is that kingdom which corresponds to the fourth kingdom of Daniel's prophecy and the one that is from John's prophecy in the book of Revelation. It is the great Roman kingdom that exists at that time. All right, now let's go on and see if we can <clears throat> figure out who the other kings are. Now, the one is, the other is not yet come. Now, that seventh kingdom, from John, the beloved point of view, has not arisen yet, that seventh kingdom. Now, this is rather interesting because we want to know who the seventh kingdom is. But it tells me this, <clears throat> something about this seventh kingdom. Now, when he does come, he must continue but a short space. That the length of reign of this seventh kingdom is very, very short. Very short indeed. Now then, he tells us what the beast is, and the beast that was, and it is not. Now, this is the beast that has the seven heads, and in these seven heads are ten horns. Now, on this beast, according to verses 1 through 7, there's a great red, har there's a great harlot that rides this beast. Now, then, it tells me something here <clears throat> in verse 11. The beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth, the eighth one, and is literally out of the seven, comes out of the seven. These seven great Gentile kings, five from, from the book of Revelation point of view, are over with. One exists. There's another yet to come. And then <clears throat> there's an eighth one that arises out of the characteristics that which it, it characterizes all of the Gentile kingdoms of the world. Do you see that? The, the eighth one comes out literally out of the seven. And the I take it the, the meaning of Scripture here is simply, when that eighth one does arise, <clears throat> he is a personification of all that's characterized by the other kingdoms. Period. Now, let's go on and see what we can learn about this one. Now, <clears throat> I'm told he's an eighth one, and he is out of the seven. Well, I'm told his destiny, he goes into perdition. Now then, Listen carefully to verse 12. And the ten horns, the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet, but will receive power as kings one hour with that beast, or with that eighth one. Do you see that? Now, Perhaps we can just shift over here by way of illustration. <clears throat> Let's just say now, for illustration's sake, 
This is that great fourth kingdom corresponding to the map of six. And we have the ten peaks or ten horns that's mentioned here in the twelfth verse of the seventh of the seventeenth chapter. Now I'm told that the beast that this harlot rides is the eighth one and he comes up. And these ten, which I believe comprise the seventh kingdom, they reign for a little time with this eighth one. But he is the great one. Now let's go on for just a little. Because it says, <clears throat> these ten horns, from John's point of view, they have not received any kingdom as yet. And they're going to exist for a while, even before this this big horn comes out uh, comes down. And it says here that they are going to give their authority and power to this one, because after all, he's going to be the man of sin and so forth. Now let's look carefully from here on down at some of the activities that take place, having explained to us what these kingdoms are. These have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto this beast. So, <clears throat> these ten kings, which came to power that makes the seventh kingdom, this one that comes up is the eighth one. These ten are going to give their authority, power, and allegiance to this one. In other words, all these ten which are the ten kings of the world, their authority and their power is going to be invested in another who is going to be the supreme ruler over all of them. Don't you see that? Now, this is just to be for a little season. All right, now let's go on. Now, it tells me in verse 14 that these ten shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them. That is, when the Lord does return, he is simply going to do away with them. But before the Lord does return, such a sad, sad thing takes place underneath the authority of this one. He's going to make war. Make war against the saints. And this is the tribulation period. Against the saints that exist in the tribulation time. And I'm told in the 13th chapter, and I hope we can read something about that tonight, that <clears throat> they're going to overcome the saints. And they're going to be persecuted. And they're going to be slaughtered. And it's going to be a terrible time. This one has power just for three and a half years. That is in the last part of the tribulation. Where he carries up all of this slaughter against the saints. And you and I are not going to be there, of course, because rapture the church is going to take place before. But now, let's go on. Their end, <coughs> uh, they shall be overcome. For the Lord of lords and King of kings, and they that are with him are called, called chosen and faithful. And he said unto me, The waters which thou sawest, where the harlot sitteth, are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. Now then notice verse 16 about these ten horns. <clears throat> and the ten horns which thou saw upon the beast, these shall hate the great harlot, who is apostate religion. And they shall make her desolate and naked, and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire, for God hath put in their hearts to fulfill his will. Now, it's just a little confusing because so many things are transpiring here according to words. But <clears throat> this great beast with the seven heads and the ten horns has a great heart, a strata. She's an apostate religion that has ridden this beast all the way down through the time of history. Ah. But in the middle of that tribulation view, 
right in the middle of those seven, seven years, I'm told that this man of sin will direct the ten kings and the kings around the face of the earth are going to devour any vestige of religion. That's right. I don't care what it is. Now, perhaps I ought to stop right here and explain <coughs> that what we're talking about is this time period called the tribulation period where these ten kings come to the fore and comprise as far as uh, the revelation uh, of uh, that of, seven, of chapter 17 is concerned, the seventh, the seventh great king. king. Now then, the man of sin, this eighth one, is going to start out. But it isn't until the middle of the week until he receives his great power, as we're going to see in the world. And it's in that middle of the week. Let's read some of the things that he does. All right, hold your hand right here and go back to Daniel chapter 11. Daniel chapter 11. <clears throat> and in the 36th verse, we're going to read something about this little horn that's come to the fore, who's the great one, he's the great eighth one. What he's going to do in verse 36. And the king shall do according to his will, and he shall exalt himself, and shall magnify himself above every god. See that? Every god. And shall speak marvelous things against the true God, the God of the God, and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished, for that that is determined shall be done. Neither shall he regard the God of his nor the desire of women, nor regard any God, for he shall magnify himself above all. <clears throat> but in his estate shall he honor the God of horses, and a God whom his fathers knew not, shall he honor with gold and silver, and with precious stones and pleasant things. Thus shall he do in the most stronghold with a strange God, whom he shall acknowledge and increase with glory, and he shall cause them to rule over many, and shall divide the land for gain. Now, what's he going to do according to Daniel chapter 11? The thing that characterizes this one is that <clears throat> the only God that he is going to regard is the God of power and possession. Gold and silver, is that right? He's not going to have any regard for uh, anything religious. No, sir. Because he's going to give the order to these ten in light of Revelation 17 to devour the great harlot, all apostate religion. And then one other passage which may help. Turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. What he's going to do. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. <clears throat> Let me read, beginning with verse 3 of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first. And that man of sin, and the Greek word is onomos here, <clears throat> that man of lawlessness. Onomos is no law or lawless. The man of lawlessness be revealed, the son of perdition or destruction, who opposes and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. What's he going to do? Listen, this eighth one, when he comes to the fore, according to Revelation chapter 17 and all these others, he's going to cause those ten those ten kings to devour religion all over the world. And I don't care what religion it is. There's only to be one religion. And that is what? Worship the 
a man of sin. That's right. Worship the godless one. Worship the lawless one. Now, <clears throat> now today we've got in many of our countries religious liberty. Because of this, there's a lot of apostate religion today. There's a lot of true Christianity, biblical Christianity, just that which you folks and I agree with, hold to and love very much, knowing the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior, and having God's Word, the Bible, that reveals Him to us, and all of these wonderful things of His plan and His program. But when we go off the scene, the rapture of the church, and the believers, all of us believers today, when we're gone, everything that's apostate, every facet of religion that does not know Jesus Christ as Savior, and all oh, there's a host, isn't that right? When you stop to realize all of the isms that have denied the blood of Jesus Christ, that denies the, uh, the death of Christ on the cross for, for the sin of the world. Listen, we as believers are mighty small in comparison with all of the Eastern religions and all of these other religions. You see, they're going to be left. Oh, oh my. They finally got rid of those heretics, those religious fanatics. And it's going to be a heyday for them for a little while. It's going to be great. There's none of these people who are preaching the blood of Jesus any longer. No. Except, of course, there's going to be a faithful remnant in the, in the tribulation period, the 144,000. They're going to have a strange doctrine that Jesus Christ is going to come back as your judge. But <clears throat> all religion, all religion, they're going to have a great, big, happy union. What the World Council of Churches is shooting for, and they're going to have a great time during the tribulation period. They're going to be woefully and wonderfully successful, but only for the first half. Because in the middle of that week, all oh, listen, all of the political kingdoms, and there are ten kings, these ten it's tenfold confederacy of the world. Under the great Messiah, the political savior of the world. Isn't that right? The man of sin. Who's going to come for He's going to give the order. And those ten are going to devour the harlot apostate religion. I'll tell you, religion comes to an end then. All then bow down, I'm told here, and he makes himself as God to sit in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God, speaking great and marvelous things. We're going to read some things, what, he, what he's able to do after this. And all religion has done this, except the man of sin. And then, oh, my, the persecution that takes place on those that have gotten saved during that time. All apostate religion is over with. And it is. It's done with. Religion on the face of this earth is over with once and for all time. But now let's notice in uh, in Revelation chapter 13 something else about this great great one here that <coughs> is is the ha is the uh, uh, lawless one in Revelation chapter 17. Let me begin reading the verse one. I stood on the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns. I'm sorry, what did I say? Excuse me. Revelation 13. Revelation 13. You know, you got you can't do what I say, you gotta do what I think. <laughs> you ever say <said> that? <laughs> well, in the thirteenth chapter of the book of Revelation, we read these words. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns. That's just what we read over the 17th chapter. Right. Now then, notice what takes place. <clears throat> and upon his horns ten crowns. 
upon his head the name of Blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were the feet of a bear, and his mouth was the mouth of lion. And do you remember in the seventh chapter of the book of Daniel, you had Babylon, the Medo Persia, and the Grecian kingdom, all under the caption of these beasts, all in the imagery of beasts, the beastly aspect of these Gentile kings. Right. Now this man of sin, he is this or this beast that comes forth, he is described in all of the godlessness of the Gentile uh, uh, terror and power <coughs> that's described in the book of Daniel. Now then it says this, <coughs> and the dragon, well, who's the dragon? You just look back in the 12th chapter and you find who he is in the ninth verse of the 12th chapter of the book of Revelation. <coughs> and the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the world and uh, into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Well, when you talk about the dragon, you're talking about the devil, isn't that right? You're talking about Satan. You're talking about the deceit. Now, the, <clears throat> please notice in verse 2 of the 13th chapter that the dragon, Satan, has given him his power and his literally throne and great authority. Well, here, this beast now that comes forth in the imagery that we're talking about is one that literally has authority and he can reign and has the power of none other than Satan himself. It's amazing. Now then, uh, some of the deception about him, and I saw one of his heads as were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wandered after the beast. I'll tell you when he arises and he comes to the fore, we've just been looking for a Messiah. We've just been looking for someone that's going to get us out of all of our problems. Listen, is the world ready for that now? Well, believe me, you, if they could find someone, they, they'd bow at his feet. Isn't that right? Yes. And, you know, <clears throat> I'm going to tell you this, that I, I saw, and maybe you have read it, uh, in the uh, Time magazine and some of the others. Uh, do you remember how powerful John F. Kennedy was? He was just a young fellow. You remember that? Very dashing, very brilliant. And, listen, when he was assassinated, the world, the world mourned his assassination. Because uh, Europe, Asia, Africa, you name it, they mourned the death of that young man because they saw in him such a tremendous world savior. That's right. And, uh, I don't know who's going to come on the scene. <laughs> I know Tim Carter's like him. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> nevertheless, uh, uh, some, they're hunting for someone. They're hunting for someone uh, to be the one that's going to be uh, the solver of all of their problems. Well, I'm told that all the world here wanders after the beast. And they worship. They worshiped the dragon, and they gave power to the beast, and they worshiped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast, and who's able to make war against him or with him? And there was given unto him a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue. How long? Or two months, three and a half years. That's the last half of tribulation period. That confirmates Daniel's prophecy of Daniel chapter 9. He's to continue with all of that authority, with all that power, with all that homage, with all that emperor worship. The world is going to bow to him. That's true. For three and a half one of these ten kings, they've done his bidding in the three and a half, in the middle of that week, they've done away. They've, they've uh, ruled out. They've obliterated all religion. Absolutely so. Oh, we why? 
Well, we don't need religion anymore. We, we, got, we got a man to worship. He's one that's empowered. Mm, what can he do? And now then, amazing thing in verse 8, and he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God. To blaspheme his name <clears throat> and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> you know, we're, <clears throat> we've, got a, we've got a lot of apostates uh, today that deny heaven. But this one that comes upon the scene, He's going to blaspheme the God of God. He's going to blaspheme uh, the, uh, the very sanctuaries of God. And then he's going to turn around and he's going to blaspheme all those who are in heaven. Now, he knows. After all, Satan's just been kicked out. Now then, it says in verse 7, was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. See, to have victory over him. And power was given him over all kingdoms and tongues and 